Hello, my dreamers and believers. It's your girl, Latina Raven, coming to you with another episode of On the Way to Famous. And today, my guest is a legend in his own right. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, you couldn't go to a bodega. You couldn't go to a salon. You <laughs> couldn't go to a club without hearing songs like One Way Love. Tears may fall. And of course, come, baby, come, baby, baby, come, come. My guest today is none other than legendary K7. Say hi, K. Hi, baby. How are you? How you feel? I am good. I am good. And you? I am super good and getting better, which, which a good friend of mine, Jerry Fontana, as used to always say. And when he used to say it to me, my eyes used to roll back in my head. But then I realized that when you say it, it, it makes you feel good that, you know, things are good. So, you know, super good at getting better, you know, always room for improvement. Of course, of course. So now we want to know from the very, very beginning, what little Lewis was like, would you tell us what you was like as a kid? Um, I was, I was very curious and I was very curious about um, music as a kid. Um, my mom, uh, she raised us in a household where she played everything. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, um, salsa or, or, you know, her Latin ballad tradition, you know, uh, of, of, you know, Tito, Tito Rodriguez and all those balladeers at the time. Yeah. Um, my mother grew up playing Nat King Cole and Johnny Mathis and Tom Jones and Sandro and Rafael and, and, and oh Sinatra and I mean she played everything in the house you know and then there would be moments where she would be playing like all the Motown stuff so she'd, she'd be playing Temptations she'd be playing you know uh rock and roll um so I grew up on everything I the Doobie Brothers was something I played in my house my mother played um the Eagles my mother played everything that you can think of um my mom had that type of um, taste for music. And so for me, it was, you know, it was curious, you know, it was like, it was funny because throughout the day I'd hear all this different stuff and all of a sudden seven o'clock would come on and my mother would turn on channel 47 or channel 41 and put on the novelas. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'd be watching this novela until it was over and then it would be some Spanish variety show and then the, you know, I would see some of the artists that she would play throughout the day. So one of the artists that got me curious into wanting to be a musician was watching Rafael and Sandro. Um, Sandro is um, Latin America's equivalent to Elvis Presley. Um, he started out in rock bands back then. And Rafael was a, 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 a Latin crooner from Spain. And these guys had their own personas, you know, like they, you know, they would dress up in these, you know, um, I want to say, you know, you know, cool suits at the time and these performances. Sandra would shake his hips and sing, you know, Rosa, Rosa, Tamaravillosa, right? And, and, you know, really trying to be really cool. And Rafael would be one of those guys that would sing and he'd take his blazer off and put one finger around the, the blazer and hang it off his neck and walk around like you know like he was really cool and and I would do impressions you know because I I was um I was mischievous so it would it started out with me making fun of them and then I would begin to sing these songs for my mother and um I didn't know that it was going to become my life being a performer. Um, I knew that I loved music so much and I knew that I loved to entertain. Um, my aunts used to take me away every summer to Puerto Rico and in, in Puerto Rico, you know, there's this thing called the, the Fiesta Patronales, which, you know, would go from town to town in, in Puerto Rico. And it'd be like, it'd be like the carnival. It'd be like carnival, you know, when, when, um, when the, when carnival comes to your town and they have all the machines, they'd have a DJ and they'd have, most of the bands of the time in Puerto Rico would be there. So my aunt was one of those people that worked around the island, putting these shows together. Um, she was part of this thing called a Club de Leones, the, the Lions Club in Puerto Rico. 
and um, she would be in charge of the entertainment. So I would meet a lot of the people that my mom grew up with and that she revered as musicians from the island. So I met Nidia Caro, I met Lucecita, I met, you know, um, uh, 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 Chucho Avellané, um, Eddie Miro. These are like guys that were popular in Puerto Rico at the time, you know, TV announcers, you know, like Eddie Miro was um, the Arsenio Hall or Jimmy Fallon of Puerto Rico. Um, Chucho Avellané was, um, I don't know, I don't know how to describe him, but he was like Robin Thicke. He was like, you know, that type of entertainer type of guy, you know, who was a singer, but yet he was also a TV host. Right. And um, I met these people and then it only kept my desire to see them. And then if there was a band, if El Gran Combo was playing, my aunt, my aunt would put me on the corner of the stage and she'd say, don't move from here because because I was close to the stage. It was the one place in the room because I was so little that you can spot me. So she can go around do her stuff and she had to look back at the stage to see where I was standing at. Mm -hmm. And I would always be in the corner and I'd be watching these bands play, um, never thinking, never knowing that this was gonna be my life, mm -hmm. you know? And as I grew up, um, what solidified my desire to be a performer was hip hop music. Um, once hip hop was there, it wasn't me imitating my mother's music. It wasn't me, um, you know, uh, thinking that I can sing to, you know, the, you know, taking it to the streets or, you know, or, you know, <laughs> or, or what a fool believes by Michael McDonald on the radio. It was me actually um, trying to, actually me doing my own stuff. And I used to write my own little raps, my own little poetry. And I used to um, turn around and turn uh, make the TV jingles of the day. I used to turn them around and make them songs. Um, as a matter of fact, it's funny, but um, Maria came from one of those TV jingles. Um, the last part of Maria, whenever she's around, you know, um, that came from a, a Coca-Cola commercial oh. that I saw. And, you know, um, I wanted to do something that felt like excitement, you know. So I wanted to go to high school for, you know, um, for advertising, but I wanted to write jingles because I didn't think I was ever going to become an artist. Right. And I, I started doing little jingles like that. So we would do, you know, the, the GE, the you bring good things to life. I would turn them into my rap name and sing these jingles. And a lot of the groups at the time, um, a lot of the famous rap groups, Cold Crush Brothers, Furious Five, um, the Force MDs, Force MCs at the time, excuse me. Um, they later became the Force MDs. Um, were doing that same thing. And I started seeing that there was um, a way for me to do it. You know, a lot of my friends were becoming famous for break dancing. I used to hang out with Rocksteady as a kid mm -hmm. and they were becoming famous. And I was trying to do these little performances and demos, you know, that weren't getting the light of day, you know. Um, and, you know, I would perform anywhere that, that they would hand me a microphone. You know? So I was part of DJ crews and stuff like that. And little by little, you know, the recognition started coming about. Um, I had so many groups before TKA um, at the time because we were trying to get put on. So I became like a, a semi-workaholic so I would write rhymes and then I would say well this is for this and that's for that so I started delegating with the things before yeah you know and um and m my groups didn't last that long you know and so the group that I had prior to us we we um we it was the most successful prior to TKA and we were working with full force at the time well we were working with members of full force we're working with Mike Hughes from Full Force, with um, Baby Jerry from Full Force, and Junior, who um, Junior was an official member of Full Force, and so was Baby Jerry. But Mike Hughes, um, his he used to work with my then girlfriend's sister. Um, my then girlfriend was named Amy, and her sister was called Nellie. And Nellie used to date my friend, who I was in another rap group with. with. So mm -hmm. they were, at, you know, Mike said, do you know anybody who could rap? And she says, well, my sister's boyfriend. And 
we went down there and we met, you know, we met the members of Full Force. We started doing demos. They played Roxanne, Roxanne to yeah. us. <laughs> and uh, and um, they played Roxanne, Roxanne to us for the first time ever. And um, they had a record out prior to me. We, um, they asked us if we, we knew a girl who could sing. And I tapped my partner, Farid Abdullah at the time. And he says, I said to him, I said, what about your sister's best friend, Lisa? who's a girl who I happened to have a crush on when I was in school, mm -hmm. um, ended up being Lisa Lisa. Um, so you know, in, in, a, in a roundabout way, we introduced Lisa Lisa to Full Force. And you know the rest was history. She had a, a record a year and change prior to me ever having a record. Mm -hmm. And the group disbanded and I got, you know, and I joined TKA. Um, I, not joined TK, but you know, we, we brought the group together. So and, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna bring you back a little bit because you're way, way ahead of me, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I I, I, <laughs> I got on a tangent, I'm sorry. Oh no, but it's, I, I love the stories. I could let you talk all day and just be like, mm -hmm, yeah, go ahead, I love it. I love <laughs> it. But we wanna know more about Little Louis, right? So did you get to do like little plays or stuff in school? Were you like always the lead? Did you steal ladies' hearts when you were small? Anything like that? I, I'm going to be honest with you. The, the stealing ladies' hearts thing, I think I was, I think I was oblivious to that because I was really concentrating on, on like, I love to entertain. So if someone looked like they were enjoying what I was doing, then I knew I won. But like, I wasn't, I didn't really get into focusing on the girls really until, until TKA. Mm -hmm. by then I was girl crazy and you know I was in I was in high school and I was like you know a, a, anything that that smiled at me in high school you know <laughs> hey she smiled at me she must like me so right, right. I lost my mind by then but um as for plays I did plays um I wasn't very um I wasn't very uh athletic in school I never was I'm still allergic to sports to this day um uh <laughs> I think the most energy that I ever exert is performance wise. Um, yeah. It, but it's always been, that's my sport. My sport is performance, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I did plays, I was never the lead. Um, I was always, you know, probably, you know, the, 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 the funny guy, you know, in, in the, always I was always happen. comic relief of some sort, you know, or a tree. <laughs> A tree. but you could be a fabulous tree i'll be a great tree you know <laughs> and um but that that's that's the most um i, I remember in school we did a we we, I, we did a play because um for star trek and mm -hmm. i ended up you know playing spock you know and that's as big as i got i was spock you, you were know. spock that's awesome yeah so i learned how to do this you see this the live long and prosper sign I learned how to do the live long and prosper sign in just one hand, because I can't do it with this one. You see, I can't do it with that. I could do it with this hand, but I can't do it with this hand. Yeah, just yeah. because of school. And I used to make um, what are the uh, communicators, the little communicators. I used to make them out of loose leaf paper. So mm -hmm. I used to be able to fold it. And then, you know, it looked like a communicator. And all my friends were like, yo, make me one. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had the hookup back then. Yeah, I feel you, I feel you. So where did you grow up? Like what borough, what was your hood? Like rep it. I was born in Spanish Harlem, um, raised in Spanish Harlem. Um, but I've lived everywhere because my mom worked for Mansina in hospital. And there was Mansina, which is a big hospital in New York City, had a, a whole bunch of different residencies for the people that worked there. So my mom, practically had us live in every single residency. Um, you know, I, my friends thought I was rich because I lived in a place with a doorman, but I really wasn't rich. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I lived like, um, I lived on 93rd Street, I lived on 96th Street, you know, in the city um, uh, because they, there were residencies there for the doctors and the nurses. And then I lived in Jamaica, Queens. I lived every single borough, you oh. know. Um, in New York, I've lived there for 
for a short stint of time, but the majority of my adolescence and the majority of my um, it has to be Spanish Harlem, which is my home, you know. So, you know, I, yeah. Okay, you were gonna say. So, so were you were you playing out in the street like a child? Like, did you play skellies and all those? You know, we played skelly, played Rubelio, we played manhunt. Um, oh man, uh, that was that was city life, you know. And the and the thing is that, um, but. City life, when you live in El Barrio um, and you play one of those games, that game could last you all day. Mm. And you may not catch your opponent all day long because, you know, we would play for blocks and blocks. We would be like, all right, so we're going to play from 100th Street to 106th Street uh, between, you know, 3rd and 2nd Avenue. You can't leave, third, you know, you can't leave that area. And that's mm -hmm. it's a big span of space. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, this generation don't know about that. Everybody's like on no, their phone. You don't know, like my, my my son, whose room I'm in, by the way, he lives in this room. And by the my, at his age, I was everywhere. You know, like like uh, I would take trips. I would get on my bike and drive this, ride the city, ride the bike all the way down to um to. Staten Island Ferry, get on the Staten Island Ferry, take the ferry to Staten Island and ride my bike around Staten Island and then come back and do the same thing back. And I'd come home and I'd be drenched in sweat, but I'd, I'd have this whole different life that I'd like travel, you know, around New York, you know, and it was always a big deal to me. Like I, like I said, I've lived everywhere. I lived in Jamaica, Queens for a while. I went to school in Jamaica, Queens for a period of time. I had a whole different set of friends in Jamaica, Queens. Yeah. And I would go see them and and I had no business being in Queens at, at the age that I was, you know what I mean? But like the world was your oyster when you lived in New York City back then, you mm -hmm. know? And it, it was, it, it made you kind of worldly and knowledgeable if you were able to get from one point to another and and be able to, you know, have friends here and there and. Yeah. It expanded your mind because the way that we were raised in Spanish Harlem was different than they were raising kids in the Bronx and it was different than they were doing in the west side of, of Manhattan and it was different what it was, you know, what was happening in Jamaica or Astoria yeah. or even, you know, downtown Brooklyn was totally different. Yeah, so it made you a well-rounded person and mm -hmm. then you were rubbing shoulders with different types of people which made you who you are today. So that's a good thing, actually. Knock on wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then most of us, when we were younger, when we were teenagers, we had like posters everywhere, kind of like what your son has back there, right? Except right. now it's anime. What was on your wall? Uh, so I had, um, I had, I, I'll post it up tomorrow on Instagram so you could see it. I mean, I'll put it on my stories just so that you can see it. Once you tag me and say you sort of taking it down, I had a room um, which was odd. I had the I had a kiss poster on one side, and I had the classic Farrah Fawcett poster on the other. Mm. You know, the mm -hmm. Farrah Fawcett, and that to me, you know, at the time as a kid was soft porn. Um, <laughs> and you know, part of me for saying that, but it was just you know, as a kid, I'm like, wow. Look at her. She's True. wearing a bathing suit, and there's nothing under that bathing suit. And I'm coming into my adolescence, but as a little kid, I was like, I can't believe my parents let me have this. And, <laughs> oh, it felt like naughty, right? It was like oh. it, it felt naughty. And 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 um, I had that on my wall. I had Kiss. I had um, I had La This oh man, I had a poster of um um. I can see it now because behind me was the bed. So this was my bed facing this way. So mm -hmm. on this wall, I had Kiss. On this wall, I had Farrah Fawcett. And in front of me, I had a, a poster of this Dominican group called El Conjunto Quisqueya that I got them all to sign the poster. And right next to it, 
I had um, from one of the um, one of the magazines, one of the the like the um, for lack of a better description, because I can't remember the actual name of the magazine, but Teen Beat, let's say Teen Beat, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees with Andy Gibb, who was the younger brother that passed away first. Right. Before, the other, be, before the other ones passed. So I had a picture of all four Bee Gees. And, and um, I, I remember that my dad used to, my stepfather used to come into the room and ridicule the fact that I had that poster up on my wall of them because the Bee Gees at the time weren't the most masculine looking men ever, you know? <laughs> no, they were it. You know, and, you know, and, and, you know, and they used to wear like shiny jackets. Little did I know I'd be wearing shiny jackets too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, but I mean, that's because you're a performer, you know, that it's okay. <laughs> Shout out to the new kids who wear shiny jackets too. What? And, the and, glittery and, and everything, yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I, you know, I because I know the fans still tune into your show. I want to shout out to all the fans that did go up to Boston. You got it's a testament to the love that you guys have for this group to see how you go out for them. And mm -hmm. shout out to all the blackheads that follow us as well and come to our shows. Because in the past couple of weeks, we've had tons of blackheads coming to our shows, and we really truly appreciate it. You know, and, yeah, because we love you too. We love you too. I was there. Yeah. I found out later that Trey Deuce was there. I would have loved to have met him. Yeah. I, as a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine uh, called me, uh, a, well, a, a fan friend called me up today and told me that her friends had, had bumped into Trey at the concert and had taken pictures with Trey at the concert. And, um, and I was like, well, you you blockheads are everywhere, you know. I like, and you communicate with each other so well. Like, like there must be like a, an underground uh, a blockhead community of phone calls that you girls spread it out really quick. Yo, know, I, I spoke to this one, you know. Yeah. Uh, Kansas, oh, Kansas spoke to Chicago. Chicago spoke to Connecticut. Connecticut spoke to, yeah, you guys. <laughs> We are, we are. We're like, okay, we, okay. At this time, we're gonna meet. Where? Oh, Paul's over here. No, Donnie's over here. All right, girl, come before you leave. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah we got that. We got that. <laughs> That's awesome. So then, now you're a little older. Did you perform like for your prom? Were you prom king? Like, did that happen? I was. I was. I'm gonna be honest with you. My last year of high school was the year that come be, uh, that um, One Way Love popped on the scene. And we weren't popular in New York, but we were popular in Miami. Mm -hmm. And the funniest thing is that my school week during my last year of high school was only four days. And at times only three days. And I'll t tell you what would happen. The reason that it became so, so, um, awkward my, my school week was because I would leave on Fridays, early on Friday morning, so I wouldn't be able to go to class mm -hmm. on Friday, right? Mm -hmm. So because I wouldn't be able to go to class on Friday, I would, I would miss it. I would miss that day. So I would leave Friday, go to Miami or go, you know, or to Texas, and I'd be there Saturday, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday, I'm supposed to come back. But if they booked us for another show, then I'd be there Sunday night as well. And then I wouldn't make school on Monday, travel back, I'd be exhausted. So then I'd have to go to school on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So I got, I missed my prom, I was away. Um, mm -hmm. I missed a lot of my senior year events. I'm not gonna lie to you. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I you know, I, I I made some of the best friends in life. You know, I, I went to high school with Mark Anthony. So Mark Anthony and I were, were in high school together. In fact, he was my best friend in high school. And we'd always used to get into trouble. So. <laughs> well, now you got to tell us some of those stories. But yeah. before you do. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, we used to have this, um, we used to have this teacher named Miss Munoz. And Miss Munoz 
used to, um, uh, she was like a social studies teacher slash English teacher. Mm -hmm. She was really strict. And she was, um, she was my third period class and Mark's third period class. And she knew that me and Mark were a problem. So what she would do is she would sit us in the front. We were the first and second chair across from her desk. And I'd come in, and I'm like, yo, not today. Don't mess with me today in class. Mm -hmm. And telling Mark to do that was like telling Mark, because Mark was, we were both the class clowns, but Mark was extreme. Mm -hmm. And the class would start, and he'd be like, nah, I'm not going to do anything. So he'd open up his notebook. And Mark was always too cool for school. If you see Mark Anthony now, Mark Anthony now is the same guy that he was then. Mm -hmm. like he's very you know thinking what like cool right <laughs> we were nerds but we were cool right and you know he'd sit there and all she'd call on me first uh and all of a sudden he'd do something and the smile would come on my face and i couldn't get it and i'd start to chuckle so she would throw him out of the room and the illest thing was that they, the front of the, the, the room had glass doors and our glass doors were huge. Mm -hmm. And what he would do is he would hide in the corner and peek into the room and he knows that I'm using my peripheral to see him. And he's making gestures to me. <laughs> and he wouldn't stop until I got thrown out. So I would be there and I'd be, trying not to pay attention, but I have a smile on my face. And she'd be like, Mr. Sharp, go, you know, get your stuff and go meet your friend outside. Go outside with your friend. So she'd throw us both out the room mm -hmm. on a regular basis. <laughs> always in trouble. We were always in the staircases doing something, you know. Um, Being our, lunch, our lunch room was, 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 we controlled the lunch room. Whether I was rapping on, you know, doing, you know, raps on the tables and, and lunch. Mm -hmm. and, We'd always be uh, entertaining somebody, you know. We, we had a friend named Andre, who's um, who's an actor now, um, and he's also a a, a one man uh, a one man uh, Broadway play, um, and he would Andre was very flamboyant, you know. He's like the first friend I ever had who was out, you know, who was blatantly and 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 proudly gay mm -hmm. and we loved Andre because Andre was just he was the coolest guy ever yeah for us so we embraced him and 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 we supported him so he'd let us joke about him he'd let us you know uh tease him and we'd give him awards like you know best girl award of the year and then you know we'd get on <laughs> you know we'd give him the award and you know, this make-believe award, and he'd come up like, you know, like like he was winning an Oscar. And, and me and Mark would always, you know, if, if you guys go online, there's a movie that Mark never wants anyone to see. It's called East Side Story. If you go on YouTube and put East Side Story, you'll see Mark Anthony's first acting debut and a story about freestyle. Um, starring Sapphire, Karina, Edis Chacon. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> that is the the character that Mark plays is him. That was who he was in high school. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I love all this inside stuff because I definitely didn't know, you know, I know we always think about celebrities, hang out with other celebrities, but we don't really know the extent of who's hanging out with who, and you'd be surprised who knows each other, right? So then you missed your prom, so you wasn't able to do that. However, though, you did mention that you were touring, basically. So when did you hear your first song play on the radio? Where were you? So where I was when I first heard my first record, which was One Way Love, I was, I was depressed that day. I think I was depressed about something in school and I decided to walk home. And I walked all the way from 68th Street, all the way to 96th Street. Um, and I, when I turned 
from Third Avenue to 96 to go up the hill to my house, um, which was two avenues up. I um I I finished seeing my friend Johnny Nagovich coming down the block, and Johnny and I, you know, weird name for a, a Puerto Rican, but he, he came by, and, you know, and I was making fun of his name. That that was our routine. He would he'd say that I have the strangest name for a Puerto Rican. My last name is Sharp. And I'd say that he had the, the strangest name for a Puerto Rican because his name was Nagovich. So we tease each other. And as, I, as we said goodbye, I'm walking up the block and I hear something familiar as I'm walking up the street. And I was like, wow, that sounds familiar. And I'm reaching the corner and all of a sudden when I reached the corner, I fully knew what song it was. And it was my song, it was One Way Love. Mm. And I was like, I, I, all I could do was stare at the car that was there because I, I was just staring in shock. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was frozen in time. And I remember the first thing I did was go in my pocket, take out a dime, that's how much the phone was then, mm -hmm. dating myself. Took out a dime, I put it in and I called my manager, Joey Gardner. And he was like, I know it's playing on the radio. And I'm like, that was the radio. And, <laughs> and I was a block away from my house. When I got home, I told my mother that. And to my mother, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a big deal that my song was on the radio. She didn't understand the importance of that at that time. You know, um, it, she later came to find the importance of, you know, how, how big, a deal having your song play on the radio is but at the time I was I thought I made it I thought I was going to be rich in 24 hours <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's it is when you're thought. young right yeah that's what I thought I thought I was going to be rich in 24 hours but you know it took it took some time yeah but I mean you was young and your song was on the radio I would have lost my shit right there I would have I feel like ah you know like <laughs> That was an amazing feeling. And then not a lot of us could say that. So now you hear your song. She didn't understand it, but it must have been cool when you went back to school and you was like, yeah, my song was playing on the radio. Like, did you get a lot of high fives? Like, It was cool. Um, it was cool that summer and school was already done. Oh. So uh i started getting noticed because the kids were like why why aren't you in school because it was the whole year and though the song was bubbling it, you know was bubbling silently it wasn't catching on because new york didn't have um a a, a radio station that embraced it what happened is uh, the first few weeks of the record it was played on kiss fm which was which for New Yorkers, it's a big radio station here in New York. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, that was the only station. We didn't have um, Hot 97 or KTU at the time. Um, KTU, um, the original KTU had died um, and Hot 97 wasn't in existence at the time. Um, as a matter of fact, it was a talk radio station at the time um, mm -hmm. when this was all happening. So Kiss was the Kiss and BLS were the only stations for New York, and they weren't playing any Latin music because because we're Latin, that's what they considered it. And so they played One Way Love for like a week, like two weeks, and we were number one every single day for two weeks on this Make It or Break It that Wendy Williams, believe it or not, was doing at the radio station until the day that. Me and the, well, I didn't make it because I, I was in school, um, but the guys went up to the radio station without me. And, and when they saw my, my olive colored counterparts, <laughs> the song fell from number one the following day and never was played on the station again. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, go figure as to why uh, that happened. Um, but we never, we didn't have radio play in New York until I want to say a year and a half later. 
So while the song was bubbling and we're getting, you know, club play from DJs like Little Louis Vega and John Gungi Rivera and Roman Ricardo and people like that, no one else was actually playing the record or really knew that the record existed. Remember, we were still kids. No one was really clubbing. You know, only some of us were, were getting to club, right? Those right. that had the permission. It was a different time. And, um, but that summer, it was coming out of every single car. You know, everyone, it was at every black party, every, you know, every pool, every, mm -hmm. every beach, every, you know, every uh, sweet 16 in the area was playing it. And we were like, something's happening, you know? And by the following year, KTU, you know, uh, KTU, um, or oh, Hot 103.5 is what they turned it into, uh, became into existence. And we were there. And then we were part of a movement because there was people like George Lamont and Sapphire and, you know, Cover Girls and so many others that were, you know, Judy Torres. And so many others were coming out of the woodwork to, um, to create part of this movement. So mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. that's how it was. Oh my God, but that must have been like so amazing. And then back then you had clubs like the Latin Quarters and Palladium and stuff like that. Because I used to go there too, you know, at the, what was, what was the other one? The Copa. I mean, uh, I seen, I seen you guys a lot at the Copa. Like I went there, you know, you even did something and Jordan Knight was part of it. I was yeah. there. I, yes. saw, I saw you guys, I followed you a lot since the nineties, just saying, but um, yeah, of course, of course. But um, yeah, it was it was a different time. The atmosphere was more fun. We used to do these weird dances. We would grab our leg, jump over it. Like I get it. It was the most amazing time. I, as soon as you said that, I could hear the music that was playing when you would do that dance step. I I, <laughs> I know I the baggy pants and the baggy so pants. Us girls who had the crop top with the baggy pants. You guys right. had the boots and stuff like and the jump. Right. And the the jump. other shoes, the pat leather okay. double 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 layer. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i know yeah but that's awesome i miss those days i want to bring those back so then if someone was to ask you what is freestyle what how would you describe it freestyle is there's so many ways to describe freestyle to me freestyle is hip-hop's cute sister mm -hmm. that he doesn't want to introduce to his friends got it uh, uh, freestyle is um, love songs sped up to 125 BPMs, you know, uh, beats per minute. Um, freestyle to me is you know, freestyle to me is love. You know, it's 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 love to to uh, love set to a fast tempo, basically. You know, like I said, the Harlequin romance set to 125 BPMs. And so being little Louie and being mischievous, hanging out with the great work Anthony as well, you know, you guys getting in trouble is so great. And now you hear your song is playing, is hot. You got Miami, you got New York. I mean, you only need those two really. And then it's on, right. And it's on and popping and you're in the club. So now you're out there and you're performing. And what was that like? Could you give someone that's never been in the industry a glimpse of what it was like to be you on stage and backstage and stuff like that? All right. So five minutes before you go on, you start worrying that you're going to forget everything that you were rehearsing for the weeks on end. So what they call the butterflies comes as a worry of that. You start thinking to yourself, am I going to forget what I learned? What is it that I got to do? Let me go over the dance steps in my mind. And you're trying to find the solitude um, to get you to that focus. At the same time, you're trying to look the part of the artist, you're trying to be cool and muster the coolness so that that you stay focused. Um, and then somebody starts bringing you to the side of the stage. And when you're on the side of the stage, now your heart is beating really, 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 really fast. And you start second guessing whether people are gonna like you or not. 
Mm -hmm. um, again, this is the description of what it was like early on for me. Mm -hmm. right? And you start wondering if the order that you picked of songs, it's the right order. And you just second guess everything that you've ever done. Right. Until the moment that they announce your name. When they announce your name, there's a roar. And at first, back then, it would be a roar from the girls, right? Mm -hmm. And that roar from the girls is almost like, it's instant mental adrenaline. And for a guy, it's honestly probably the most satisfying sound ever because it's acceptance. It's the sound of acceptance. Right. And the, the, the sound of people wanting to see you, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's for 15 minutes, the image of who they think you are. Then when you walk up, you just want everything else to be perfect because that moment when they're screaming is perfect. So you start performing and it's like, am I going to get to the other side of this? Mm -hmm. And you just start looking at faces. You're looking to connect with someone. You're looking to see someone smile. You notice the person who's not smiling. You notice the person who's um, turning around to talk to their friend while you are doing your best move. Right. Those are the things that you notice. For me, it's like a lot of times when, and even to this day, it's like the, it's like slow motion. Um, sometimes we do a 10 minute show. Sometimes we do a 20 minute show, but to me, it, it all feels like an hour. Mm -hmm. It all feels like an hour because time just goes into this warp. And you are everywhere. You're noticing. If you ever see me nowadays, you'll see me cracking up on stage. It's because I'm, I'm now, I, I guess because I'm older, I appreciate the funny stuff that I see on stage more. And it's, it's a sitcom to me. It's my favorite show to watch, the audience. My favorite show to watch is the audience. I get, um, I get, I see the strangest things. I see some of the funniest things ever. I see some of the most awkward things ever. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I see some of the, in some cases, I see some of the rudest things. Ever. Last week I was performing. I'm just killing myself. I'm, I'm drenched in sweat. I'm performing outside. I'm getting bit by mosquitoes on the back of my neck because it was an outdoor show by a bunch of bushes. Mm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Rhode Island. And there's a mosquito biting my neck and it's killing me. And there's a girl like this. She's, she's just standing there with her phone. Mm. And I mentioned to her and she's like, <laughs> and I go, I, I still see you. I'm dying up here. And she's like, <laughs> I'm like you know, oh I, and I've seen it. I mean, and it's funny because I even see it. I even see it when other people are performing. I've 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 gone to a new kids concert, and, and um, they were here in Jersey. Um, I went to see them here in Jersey. Vic uh, Vic Popovic got his tickets to see it here in Jersey, and I went to see them perform. And I remember specifically watching the front row ahead of me. At first, that phones were just snapping pictures away. And then at one point, the girl pulled out his phone and I'm like, and uh, Joey, Joey is singing, please don't go girl. And the girl's in texting. I'm like, he's singing a classic. Oh my God. That's a classic. Mm. I'm like, you know, and, bro, and, and you know, Joey goes all in when he's singing that song. So I'm like, yeah. so I know it's not just for me. I, I, I know that people do it for all artists. And I think that we live now in the age of distraction. So, you know, a lot of people get distracted, but it's the most living that moment back then, 
it's the most satisfying moment ever. Um, when, when I, you mentioned the Palladium, and when I, when that was my favorite place to ever perform, mm -hmm. and the crowd was like, I, I never wanted that show to end. I never wanted like, and that's the feeling for an artist. It's funny because you go up there, you, you, you can't wait. Sometimes you plan the whole week out for that one moment for those 30, 45 minutes that you're up on stage. And then when it's over and you walk off, there's a sadness in the pit of your stomach because damn, I gotta wait another week to feel that fun again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I, I think that's why, and uh, like, if you ever saw um, the, the representations of, of singers and actors, it's always the happy face and the sad face. You always have the happy, sad face, right? It's and it's because we're meant to give you, that's what we're trying to bring out. We're trying to bring the emotion out of you. But in all actuality, sometimes it brings out the emotion in us because even when we succeed, even when we do the best show, on the way back to the dressing room, yeah, you know, people are patting us on our back and telling us how great it was. But we're like, I didn't want that to end. Mm. You know, I don't know. I want to go back out, do an encore. I want to go back out. I want to go back out. I want to keep doing it. It's, you know, uh, I think all artists fear the end of the dream. Right. So we all look at the end of that show saying, is that my last show? Am I going to be able to do it again? You know, we always worry about the end of the dream. So I, I, I think that that's why we feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I used to do stand up comedy and I would have to I have to drink like two shots before getting on stage because that shit is scary. And then you get up there and it's like, oh, my God, please don't let me forget the words. Please don't let my jokes be whack. Please don't. Let... And then I do I love it. To see you do stand up. Yeah, I do it. It goes great. And then it's like, oh, that was it. I got to go back up there. I got to go back up there. And then it just ends. And you're like, oh, I totally get exactly what you're talking about. But I'm the type of person I can't eat or anything before I perform. I don't know if that's the same for you, but a lot of artists I, told me the same thing. They yeah. can't eat till after the show. You know what, I, what used to happen to me? Um, I used to, once it was over, the next day, I'd go over the, the, the entire show back in my head and I would say, damn, I should have said this instead of this. I mm -hmm. should have done that instead of that. And I try to reenact the moment, reliving what I should have said as opposed to what I said. Mm -hmm. Strange thing. I'm yeah, no, because you, you become without knowing a perfectionist, right? And then, you know, I could have done that better. You, you become your own judge. Yeah, and then you judge yourself, and then it's like, ah, but you're fine. You guys are fabulous. I love you, so don't even worry about it. <laughs> even so when you mess up, you know what happens? You know what that tells me? That tells me that you're human, just like us, and it kind of brings you down from the pedestal just a little bit, right? Because we kind of want to relate to you, too. We, we love the dream. We love that you're here, but we want to know that, oh, they're just like us. That makes you even cooler in my eyes. My opinion. <laughs> I, 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 I fell in front of 15,000 people flat on my back one time. <laughs> and well, as I fell and I landed on the floor, you heard 15,000 people all at once go. <gasps> and all, all I could say was I fall in and I can't get I up. Can't and then, you know, I heard a chuckle from the audience and I got back up and I kept performing, but and my guys couldn't stop laughing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I love that. Yeah, but see, if you can't laugh at yourself, you can't get through those moments. Well, I'm, That's I'm, really funny. I'm I, I laugh at everything I do. I, I you know, yeah. Now, 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 um, it's funny, but I think I enjoy performing now more than than I did when I was younger because now it's like, I I know that tomorrow's not promised, so I enjoy a lot more now. You know what I mean? I I think mm -hmm. that. I think I've, I feel lucky and privileged to, to have maintained my dream for such a long period of time. Yes, you are blessed and that's a good thing. But we're also at that age where, eh, ha, I mean, no importa, I don't care. Whatever no, no, happens, no. happens. I can't, trust me. My wife's like, you spent so much money on clothes. I'm like, <laughs> so that, you know, I can't. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I totally get it. So then now you've you're here. You're you are now a legend. There is no dream anymore. You're living the dream. Most of us dream what you're living. So it is amazing. And now you have a song that you did with your son, which is amazing. Hangover with Jason, the vice versa. I mean, that shit is hot and I love it, right? So you got from there to here. Now you're introducing the next generation. You got the next generation of you out there doing this thing. What is that like? Proud dad, tell us that part. I'm a proud dad, period. Like he could have decided to be a janitor and I'm gonna be a proud dad. I'm I'm just I'm just happy. I'm happy for him. Mm -hmm. Um I'm really ecstatic for him, to be honest with you. Um mm -hmm. I didn't think that he was gonna follow suit into the music. I didn't think that that he was gonna follow me into doing music um and carve his own lane and do, um, I believe he's doing far better than me. Mm -hmm. Because he has more records out than I ever did, you know? And, you know, and having an extension of you uh, do, do what you do, it is the weirdest thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, and to let him become his own man on his own without your help and surpass any expectations that you had as a father, right? Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be that father that's hovering over his head trying to tell him what to do. I just wanted to be a friend and friend enough to advise him and then be able to step back and let him make his own decisions. Right. But every time I look at something that he does, I'm overjoyed. Mm -hmm. I'm overjoyed by by everything he does. You know, I think I think uh, like he. I try not to show it, but I try to let him know that you know, like I buy everything he does. He, you know, I don't know if you can even tell who buys your stuff anymore. You know, <laughs> but I I buy everything he does, and I have everything that he's ever done, and I'm super proud of him, and yeah. You know, you know, but as a dad, you know, I'm dad about, I'm, I'm proud of both of all three of my kids. You know, my daughter is everything. Yeah. I, I don't know if you could hear, but she's yelling for me now. Oh, she, no. She's not that she's yelling for me now. Um, and then, and then my son whose room I'm in, he's, you know, he's everything. He's, he's the, he's me. Out of all my kids, the one that acts the most like me is, 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 my my middle son yeah you know? and, so the, you know. yeah <laughs> so so that i can let you go be dad since your baby's calling for you could you tell us what's next for k7 tka and everyone we're going on a cruise this year um it's not the new kids cruise i'm sorry girls um but we, <laughs> i wish I uh, <laughs> we're, we're going we're going um on a cruise with all our freestyle friends um then musically i have um, hangover is out now streaming on all platforms i have a a song from a new project that i started with my former partner ab cruz um uh, you know one of the uh, original voices of the freestyle movement an original member of tka um and it's called actual that should be out in a couple of weeks and that project is something that i'm really fond of and very happy with Mm -hmm. um you know it, it's exciting i got new tk coming out for uh 2022 um i'm holding all tk until 2022 i got a kl project aside from my k7 project i'm doing a project as my my 80s alter ego as you guys know when i first started tka i was i, I went on the the moniker of kl Mm -hmm. And um, which is now my both my son's middle name. So both my sons are KLs, and, and my daughter is a Kailani. Um, but uh, I'm doing an uh, 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 an album's worth of work under my alter ego KL. And uh, but I'm excited. Uh, 
I'm really excited about the music that we're creating. Um, it's different. It's an evolution in uh, for the the K7. The K7 is not freestyle, but the the KL, the actual, the TKA, and I'm helping my partner AB Cruz. I'm I'm producing. Uh, I'm being executive producer and overseeing his project, which I've never been so proud to be part of something like that. And you know, Yay. more, more music, more music, more shows. As a professional, bravo! But as a fan, oh my god, I can't wait! Cause look, look, look what I'm repping. I stay repping free. Ah, oh. I'm, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you a, a hangover shirt. I'm, I'm oh. making a hangover. Sure. Yes, please. Yes, please. I totally want it. I want a TKA shirt. I want K7. I want everything. I'm a rep it. I'm a rep it. Mm -hmm. you. Yep. You need, you need, you need this girl in one of your music videos. I'm just saying, you know. Find out you a video vixen too. <laughs> I'm everything. Don't you know? I will be in there. You need me in there. <laughs> Thank you for being on my show and taking the time to talk to us. I'm here for you anytime you need me, Mama. So now, for all of you, stay safe, stay humble, and as always, do it with me, Kay. Stay fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. <laughs> All right.